We want nature to be understood, uh, we want it to be valued, and we want it to be protected. And that theme of protection uh, is uh, really our theme uh, for this evening. Uh, so our speaker, very, very uh, honoured to introduce uh, Professor Rosalind Duffy, Rosaline Duffy. Uh, she's Professor of International Politics at Sheffield University. Sheffield is a, uh, one of our major cities in the north of England. And her research focuses on uh, the politics of conservation, especially wildlife trafficking. And she's the author of several important publications on nature crime and what is sometimes called green collar crime. Uh, please remember to put your questions um, in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, and uh, Rosaline, over to you for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll we'll have questions. Okay, great. Thank you both very much. And I'm really delighted to, to do this talk. It's um it's great to kind of reach out to a, an audience who of interested people who are interested in conservation. And I think, you know, um what we can think about really is uh if you think of me working on illegal wildlife trade, you might imagine that I was on some kind of spectacular journey through a rainforest, that I might have been hanging out in a national park looking at wonderful wildlife. But actually, for the research for this book, I found myself standing in the Ministry of Defence in London on a very cold, rainy day, waiting to meet with someone who had started an initiative for using the British Army units to train anti-poaching teams in Malawi and Gabon. And how that had come about was that he had seen Prince Charles, now King Charles, um, talk about the need for the United Kingdom to form a practical response to the really concerning rises in poaching of elephants and rhinos. And this had inspired him. And I was really fascinated to try to understand um, why he thought that his military skills and experience in Afghanistan could be deployed to train anti-poaching teams. And of course, it all went nice and smoothly until I was ready to leave the building. And I was told very clearly not to touch the big red button, which was right quite close to the big green button. And as I tried to exit the building, I managed to press the wrong button and locked myself down with all the security teams and MOD running towards me as people waved their arms around saying, no, 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 it's just another silly visitor. Um, and as I got outside, I was breathing deeply to try and compose myself. And I kind of reflected on what had just happened and what it meant for my research. And to me, the meeting was really indicative of this growing engagement between conservation and the security sectors. And that was born out of this sort of renewed sense of urgency um, in around about 2000, 2008, 2009. Um, but I think one of the things that I think is really important to say is that um, this was both a, a break with the past, but also a continuation of some of the kinds of trends and dynamics that we've seen in conservation over decades. And I'll explain that a little bit more. And so my book explains this integration of conservation and security, um, how it's happened and what the implications are for both conservation um, and for security in the longer term. And I've, I've got a copy of the book here, which is now showing backwards <laughs> because of the camera. Um, but, you know, as I say in the slides and in the chat, uh, you can order it from the Yale uh, University Press book uh, website um, with the discount code as well. And I spent several years really researching this book. Um, and it was a really interesting project that I was involved in. And I think conservation is really changing. What we're accustomed to is this notion that conservation is directed by scientists who are wielding notebooks or running computer models, they're watching wildlife behaviours or collecting plant samples. Um, but the rapid growth in poaching and trafficking of some of the world's most iconic species has generated this sense of real urgency that something needs to be done to save them from the illegal wildlife trade. And as a result, conservation and conservationists broadly can now look very different indeed. Um, so in some places, the notebooks, the computers and the sample jars have been replaced by weapons, high tech surveillance systems and intelligence networks. I and mean, it's become harder and harder to distinguish between conservationists and the people and practices that we normally find in the security sector. 
So scientists have been replaced in some, in some locations by security operatives that are trained in intelligence gathering, use of weapons and surveillance technique. And the object of their gaze is not the plants and animals in the ecosystem, but the humans that might threaten them. And I think this signals a really key shift. The attention of conservationists is moving away from a focus on ecological monitoring and data gathering and saving species onto a much fuller focus on people, either as individuals or as part of global networks, who are defined as a sort of a, a very broad kind of enemy or threat to wildlife. And in the book, I won't go into it in much detail here, but in the book, the sort of theoretical context is, is that I'm bringing together green criminology, political ecology and international politics to sort of build this idea of a political ecology of security. Um, as I said, I won't go into that much here, but I'm happy to take it up in um, Q&A afterwards. But I think that when the illegal wildlife trade is defined as a security issue, um, it's more than just an exercise in framing, you know, it's more than just words, it's more than just the way people talk about wildlife, and it's also more than just a normal response to threats to wildlife. Instead, it moves us from a situation of enforcement as a strategy of last resort and towards enforcement as the option of first resort for conservation agencies, for NGOs, governments, donors and international organisations. But first, I thought it might be useful to talk about the scale of the wildlife trade. And it really is big business. The sheer scale of it um, is, is, is actually quite difficult to capture. It has two forms, both the legal and the illegal, and both are highly valuable global trades. So traffic, which is one of the most well-known um, organisations that collects data on illegal wildlife trade, estimates that the legal trade in wildlife products into the European Union alone is worth 100 billion euros per annum. So the scale of illegal trade is much more difficult to estimate because of its clandestine nature, so we can only make best guesses. Um, but there are sorts of estimates that it might be worth between 8 and 20 billion euro annually. But the range of estimates from different agencies in US dollars is that it can be 7 billion or it might be as big as 23 billion. And valuing the trade is really challenging because it's really difficult to separate out the legal and illegal trades in particular species because they're often deeply intertwined. And that's where the kind of green collar crime approach comes in, which I'll talk about later. Um, and profiles of demand and supply can change really rapidly. So one of the things that I want to say is, is that wildlife products isn't all ivory, rhino horn and pangolin scales. Actually, wildlife products are part of everyday lives for most people around the world. They are, wildlife products are used as food, as clothing, as medicines, curios, furniture, ornaments and jewellery. So rhino horn and pangolin scales, of course, are well known to be used in medicine. Ivory is for curios and ornaments. There's also a thriving caviar trade in Europe, both legal and illegal. There's a trade in birds of prey, both the birds and the eggs, from Scandinavia to the Gulf states. Frogs and reptiles from Madagascar and Vietnam are in demand as pets in Europe for vivarium. And rosewood is trafficked from Madagascar for highly prized high-end furniture in China. And I would bet that if you looked around your house, if you looked in your fridge, or at what you're wearing, you will find a wildlife product of some kind. Most of it will be legal, but some will be illegally sourced and transported, and you won't even know it. So the reason for those two pictures that I have on the slide is, is that this shows the number of different fashion items that can be made from uh, reptile skins, um, and, and also the earrings on the other side, they're actually stingray skin. Um, so wildlife products, are, it's a much wider um, trade and the, the range of products that are used is much wider than just for medicines or for ornaments and curios. And what this shows is that it's a global trade. It's not a trade that's confined to Africa and Asia as is sometimes assumed. Europe, for example, is a site of demand, supply and transit for wildlife products, both legal and illegal. And the sheer scale of the trade, coupled with low penalties and low risks of being caught, means that it's much very attractive to criminal networks. 
And there are concerns that it might fund and sustain criminal activity, armed groups and other uh, organized crime networks. And several, there are, as a result, there are several new in global initiatives from the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, from the World Customs Organization and from the World Bank's Global Environmental Facility to tackle it. And of course, no talk on the illegal wildlife trade would be complete without at least some mention of COVID-19. Um, and by 2019, um, conservationists were beginning to kind of celebrate a little bit that the news around poaching, particularly of elephants and rhinos, was starting to look quite good. Um, rates of poaching were slowing, um, but then there was the eruption of COVID-19, which provided a new impetus to focus on the wider risks that might be posed by the wildlife trade, both legal and illegal. And you'll remember, I'm sure, that there were concerns um, that markets where different kinds of animals were kept in close proximity in crowded conditions might lead this to a kind of situation where a virus might jump species. And the markets in Wuhan were identified as a potential or probable source with the most likely origin uh, being bats. Conservation and animal welfare organizations amongst others in 2019 and 2020 seized on this um, to talk about the need or talk about it as evidence for the need to ban all wildlife markets, whether legal and regulated or illegal and unregulated in the interests of global public health. And this sort of reforged a sense of urgency that also fed into thinking about conservation and tackling illegal wildlife trade as a global security issue, uh, that we needed to take these steps before the illegal wildlife trade either drove some species to extinction or that we must act because there were significant threats to human health and well-being. And the irony wasn't lost on me that in the final stages of writing the book, um, uh, uh, writing a book about the illegal wildlife trade, um, I was also one of those people whose lives changed very suddenly in March 2020 and our world shrunk um, to the confines of our houses as uh, countries across the world instituted lockdowns to try to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. And those were very challenging circumstances in which to finish a book, particularly because uh, uh, global health had not been part of the original research. And so there was a need for me to kind of rapidly integrate it, um, but do so without leaving my own house. Um, so it was quite it was quite a challenging point at which to try to finish a book. But I got there um, in the in the end. So. Oh, sorry, I, I won't say here's, here's um, a graph from uh, an organization called Save the Rhino, which has got terrific um, information on all of these things. And this can show you, this shows you the sort of very steep rises in rhino poaching across Africa from 2006. And you can see it peaks in 2015 and then starts to go down again and level off in 2020, 2021. Um, and we're still waiting for the, the latest figures um, but it does look at the moment as though rhino poaching in South Africa is kind of uh, at a steady state and it's certainly not as high as it was in 2015. And these were the kinds of figures that conservationists were starting to celebrate that those rates of poaching were coming down and then the COVID-19 pandemic uh, broke out. So what does it mean then if we define um, illegal wildlife trade as wildlife crime? Um, and this was the theme um, of this major conference in London, which I was at, the picture there um, is, is of the opening plenary of the conference that was hosted by the UK government. And it, you know, the slogan with it was end wildlife crime. And very often the terms illegal wildlife trade and wildlife crime, crime although they're not the same thing, can be used interchangeably as terms. And the shift towards defining illegal wildlife crime more broadly as, uh, sorry, illegal wildlife trade more broadly as a form of wildlife crime or a serious form of organized crime has presented conservationists with this really vexing question. What new approaches are needed to prevent further wildlife, wildlife losses? Um, and the answer that emerged in the wake of the poaching crisis was this faith in security oriented approaches. 
Um, this shift in thinking has been achieved first by redefining and elevating illegal wildlife trade from being just a regular form of crime to being a form of serious crime. And once something gets designated as a serious crime or a form of serious and organised crime, it allows much greater interagency cooperation, both nationally and internationally. So it does make a difference. And secondly, it's been achieved by arguing that the trade is a funding strategy for non-state armed groups. And by that, you might be more familiar with terms like rebel groups, terrorist groups, or armed militias, um, or that they are providing funds for organized crime networks, including mafia, Russian mafia, triads, amongst many others. And of course, there are concerns among states and in the international community that all of these groups might be a destabilizing influence. So there's a, an interest in what's their funding strategy and therefore if illegal wildlife trade is part of their funding strategy that's also of interest to states so i'll step back for a moment um, and say you know how did i get into this you know where did this book come from uh, where did the ideas and why did i think it was important um so I've always been interested in wildlife and in conservation, and I had this real love for history and politics um, all the way through. And in my PhD work, which was a very long time ago now, um, in the mid nineties, on the politics of wildlife conservation in Zimbabwe, I was able to bring those two things together, the love of wildlife and conservation and the love of history and politics. And I've researched lots of different areas of tourism, market-based conservation, the creation of these huge transfrontier conservation areas across regions. Um, and then I shifted to work on the illegal wildlife trade. So, you know, earlier on in my career, my field work might have included um, going to work on uh, lima conservation in Madagascar, or I was looking at the ivory trade in Zimbabwe. But much more recently, um, it's meant that I've had to go to the major kind of seats of power in the international system. So. That's why I have the picture of uh, Capitol Hill in Washington, because I spent some time there while I was researching the book. And the only wildlife I could find was this squirrel in a bin that's eating a Cheeto in the park nearby. Um, but I noticed one of the reasons I got into this and started writing the book was that I noticed that from around about 2010 onwards, the rises in poaching meant that there was this intense concern about how to save iconic species. And when I gave talks, there were new kinds of people in the audience. There were military personnel there. There were also private businesses um, that specialized in either risk assessment or drone manufacturing. And this really made me curious, you know, why were they there? Why were they interested in what I had to say? This was a new thing for me um, and also a slightly uncomfortable thing for me. I wasn't sure what the purpose of their attendance at my talks was. I was used to illegal wildlife tree trade being very low down the list of government priorities. And certainly it wouldn't have been a concern for the military or for drone manufacturers or um, any other kind of government agency. In fact, the constant refrain was is that those who were involved in trying to tackle the illegal wildlife trade felt overlooked and underfunded. So what was different? And I think it was this change um, in um, high profile campaigns about the need to save elephants and rhinos that actually produced that, uh, that actually started to produce that change. There were lurid stories of very well funded armed gangs and helicopters, what operating with helicopters, that they had night vision goggles, um, that there were sophisticated trafficking networks that were linked to organized crime. And it seemed that poaching was not was was now becoming a matter of national and international security that wildlife crime itself could be destabilizing governments it could be for funding armed groups and even claims that it funded international terrorism so what's the problem with de defining illegal wildlife trade as a security issue and in the book um i argue that um it creates some really powerful omissions that are really important. So I argue very much against seeing illegal wildlife trade as a matter of crime, and instead think it's more um, appropriate and more effective to think of it 
as an expression of global inequalities of harms against people, wildlife and ecosystems instead. And by looking at illegal wildlife trade through the lens of wildlife crime or as an issue of crime or security, the problem is, is that this doesn't really address the longer term and underlying drivers of poaching and smuggling. And this moves conservation away from approaching the trade as the result of economic inequalities, of social injustice or of the ongoing legacies of colonialism. So to explain this, um, I'll give an example about poaching. So we need to be mindful of how hunting laws were established during the colonial era and how they were designed to criminalize African hunting methods, but protect European sport hunters. So African hunting methods using traps and snares were outlawed and deemed to be poaching, and they were deemed to be unsporting and cruel by colonial authorities, particularly in um, former British colonies. Um, in contrast, more European methods of hunting with rifles, often for sport, um, was, uh, was, was cast uh, much more clearly as gentlemanly, as sporting and as humane. So the hunters, the sport hunters during the imperial period, during colonialism, um, uh, presented themselves as the first conservationists. It was their concern to protect wildlife to continue their hunting that led to the establishment of the first conservation NGOs in the UK. So, for example, the Society for the Protection of the Wild Flora and Fauna of the Empire, which is now Flora and Fauna International. So uh, the origins of some of those conservation organisations come from um, the, the beginning of, of from, from the earliest years of defining European methods of hunting as sport hunting and African methods of hunting as poaching. And we also need to be mindful of how national parks, particularly in Africa and in South Asia, are often built on a history of very violent exclusion and eviction. Some of the most famous parks in the world, Serengeti, Masai Mara, Kruger, were created during the colonial era as wildernesses via the eviction and then go ongoing exclusion of the African communities that lived there. This isn't past history, it's very current reality for many communities that have been evicted from those areas and then face the kind of full force of conservation authorities trying to maintain these wildernesses within national park boundaries. And this, I think, can in part explain. Uh, the ongoing resistance to them and also helps us understand in part, not entirely, but helps us understand why illegal hunting of wildlife might continue, even though it's against the law and there may be heavy penalties. So I think it's really important that we understand the history of the term poaching and how it's been applied to particular practices and communities and not to others. So one simple definition of poaching is any hunting or removal of wildlife um, that's sanctioned by the state or the private sector. Um, and commercial hunting, um, we need to distinguish that um, from subsistence poaching. So subsistence poachers typically target, target smaller animals for food. They re might rely on traps and snares and tend to have a less significant impact on uh, wildlife populations. Um, of course, some forms of illegal hunting for meat straddles both subsistence and commercial scale activities, particularly if we think about the way that some types of animals might be hunted to feed uh, miners or loggers in, uh, who, who, might be, uh, who might have been set up in, in remote rainforested areas. Um, uh, commercial poachers uh, it, tend to be much more organised. Um, they target more valuable species that are um, in demand for trade rather than for subsistence. Um, typically rhinos, elephants, tigers, pangolins and some other species. So commercial poachers may have more advanced technologies including uh, firearms, GPS units and mobile phones. Uh, they may have a more significant impact on wildlife and these are the groups which have tended to grab the attention of NGOs, governments and the media. But one of the difficulties is, is that in attempts to tackle illegal wildlife trade and in, in attempts to tackle poaching, all forms of poaching get bundled together 
um, in uh, as one, um, and then strategies to tackle them don't differentiate between different kinds of poachers and therefore they might not be as effective as they could be. So I think the ways we think about poaching is really important and the switch to describing the illegal wildlife trade as wildlife crime makes this kind of politics of poaching really invisible. Um, it communicates the idea that the perpetrators are criminals who knowingly and willingly engage in breaking the law, um, that they're greedy and they only do it for their own benefit. But this is a really partial view of poaching, which doesn't really address how in some places colonialism might have created poaching as a category of illegal behaviour and some communities may engage in illegal hunting for all sorts of reasons, either to make ends meet, they may be pressured by external networks to engage in poaching um, and they may have a lack of other opportunities. So I think a further problem is, is that focusing on security and crime makes it much harder to develop and support alternatives that might um, be more effective, including looking at providing livelihood alternatives or demand reduction in wealthier countries. So in short, there wouldn't really be any demand for ivory or rhino horn. Sorry, there wouldn't really be any poaching or trafficking of ivory and rhino horn if there was no demand for it. And often demand comes from wealthier communities around the world. And I think that's what we need to address um, the kind of uh, dynamics of wealth and inequality which drive demand, as well as the sort of historical and cultural reasons for continued demand in certain wildlife products. And I think it underplays um, uh, what Dan Van Oom has called green collar crime. Um, and this is where I'll give a shout out to my new project and uh, a fantastic project team that you can see where we're working on, Be it's a project called Beastly Business and we're working on green collar crime. And that's uh, environmental crimes committed knowingly or unknowingly by legal entities. And we're using this approach in the current project to look at illegal wildlife trade in Europe. And we're focused on the trade in bears, eels and songbirds. Um, and this project has partly been generated because of the ways that our previous research showed that there was this over-focus on Africa and Asia and that the dynamics of the trade in Europe and trade in European species was just completely overlooked. You know, Europe is a major site of production, consumption and transport of wildlife, things like caviar, glass eels, songbirds, wild garlic, timber, amongst many other products are all traded uh, within Europe. And this way of thinking about the illegal wildlife trade, I think, um, contests this idea that it's a security threat to governments and global stability. Instead, it's looking at how uh, wealth and inequality might drive the illegal wildlife trade. So I'll use two examples from the book um, to uh, kind of give a flavor of why thinking about illegal wildlife trade as a crime and a security threat can be problematic. Um, and international funding for tackling the illegal wildlife trade and the ways that private military companies have moved into offering their services for conservation are two good examples, I think. So first with international funding. So you can see from this figure, uh, this is from the Global Environmental Facility, which is a, um, a fund from, of, of the World Bank. Um, and it shows the amount of funding for conservation received by geographical location from donors. And you can see that there's a disproportionate, um, a disproportionate amount goes to Africa and Asia compared to other regions. Um, in, in tapping into this, these, these funds that have been made available, there is an element of opportunism at work for both the conservation and the security sectors. Each is entrepreneurial. For the security sector, conservation might provide new markets and testing grounds for their products and techniques. And for conservation, uh, using security oriented approaches brings important new streams of funding, uh, it brings a great deal of public attention, and it can also bring policy commitments from some of the world's most powerful actors. So if we look at um, uh, figures from uh, from the UK. So the UK has this illegal wildlife trade challenge fund. Um, and you can see from the two figures there that this commitment um, uh, from the illegal wildlife trade challenge fund, which was established in 2013, um, by 2019, it had allocated just over 23 million uh, pounds to 75 projects. 
and the relative balance of projects across the three themes of sustainable livelihoods got six funded projects strengthening law enforcement and the role of criminal justice system got 62 funded projects and demand reduction got seven funded projects so the disparity is really clear many many more projects 10 times as many projects on law enforcement and the criminal justice system were funded than the other two priority areas of livelihoods and demand reduction and also i think the geographical breakdown is really important and really interesting funded projects shows that there were more projects, 40 projects in Africa and 25 in Asia. The European Commission equally is one of the major donors for tackling the illegal wildlife trade. Um, and it's highlighted the need to integrate conservation with security as well. So the European Commission uh, produced a report in 2019 on the intersections between wildlife conservation and security in Africa and stated that it, uh, it was necessary to expand and increase investment in conservation security development programs in protected areas in Africa to achieve global, regional and local security and stabilization. So there was a very clear steer there that conservation was also about local and national security and stabilization. And I think the sort of arguments about the illegal wildlife trade and its role in potentially funding armed groups really taps into some deep-seated fears, um, pre-existing deep-seated fears um, around terrorism post 9-11. Um, and since NGOs need to compete for funds, it makes financial sense to link conservation and security concerns together. And the consequences of this are much heavier levels of enforcement of militarization in conservation and of violence at the hands of conservation authorities, um, uh, 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 at the hands of conservation authorities. So my next example is the, the way that um, the, the way that this kind of expansion of funding made available for enforcement led approaches has also allowed the entry of private military companies and also of militaries into the conservation sector. So the expansion um, of private sector military and security operators in conservation has accelerated, I think, um, as a result of the availability of demobilized military personnel from interventions in the Middle East. And there are several examples of companies staffed by war veterans from international interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq who offer their skills to conservation. One of them is Veterans Empowered to Protect African Wildlife, which is a US-based organization, VetPOR. There are others, Maisha Consulting, International Anti-Poaching Foundation, amongst many others. And I think they encourage particular ways of thinking about conservation, um, which can be more oriented towards their own worldviews, which may not match those of local communities or of national governments. And this includes categorizing certain types of people or groups as the enemy, as well as animals or national parks or ecosystems as things to be defended. So it's not just that they bring their training and their training and their skills, it's also that they bring a, a mindset with them as well. And I have to say, this isn't a brand new development, actually. Um, the arrival of private military companies into conservation. Uh, there was a very high profile and controversial example in the 1990s of the use of a private intelligence and security operator called KAS Enterprises by WWF International. Um, so it, so these, I, these approaches have been trialed in the past, but I think there's been a much greater extension and use of them um, in the last 10 years. Um, there are high profile examples of private military companies that have now kind of become much more widely known um, and much more widely used in interventions. They offer a range of services to be bodyguards in humanitarian assistance missions to the protection of oil platforms. Um, high profile examples, of course, include Eric Prince's Blackwater, which was later called Academy, but there are many more. Um, and this sort of wider dynamic of the use of private military companies to provide security services has also shaped conservation practice. Um, 
as new companies sprang up, um, as more and more personnel were demobilized following the interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, new companies popped up with a search for new markets for their skills. And this search was then met with an apparent need for security services in conservation. And as conservationists expressed concerns that wildlife prime poaching and insecurity were key and rising threats to some iconic species, there were these new private military companies offering their services and saying that they, can, they could help. So what motivates people to move into conservation following these military careers? Um, and the shift in the military, or the shift from a military to a conservation career can be seen as part of a wider career path for some individuals, that once they've left the military, they have several options, including taking more mainstream and lucrative contracts for big name private military companies. So one of the private contractors engaged in training US military veterans to work in conservation that I spoke to, they pointed out that they do have commitments to wildlife and that they could eat, but they could easily earn far more in the private sector. So when I met him, he said to me, on average, our veterans, the guys and girls that go out on the ground and do this work, they could go and work for Blackwater or Triple Canopy. They could go and be working for them in Afghanistan and they could be making five or $600 a day. That's not counting their per diem payments. But a lot of our guys and girls on the ground, they volunteer their time and they're not even getting paid. So while conservation can be, um, sorry, while conservation can be one uh, career avenue, it's important to note that for many ex-military, they join it because of this sort of genuine commitment to wildlife or because they feel that their skills and their kind of can-do attitude can be of use. So one war veteran who now works in conservation explained to me that the reason he got into it was that he'd watched a documentary on CNN which showed a now infamous uh, piece of footage of an elephant with its sunk trunk severed and a rhino in South Africa which was still alive and bleeding profusely following the removal of its horn by poachers. And he described to me how all of my emotions from war, he said, that I'd stuck into a jar, that I'd screwed tight, as tight as I could, I'd super glued it shut, he said. That rhino, that elephant and that whole documentary unscrewed that jar for me and I cried for a week. So he recognised that this was a really intense response and that he really felt that he needed to do something to save these animals. But interestingly, he also reflected on how this wasn't necessarily the best motivation and that in the early days of the organization that he'd set up he'd made some mistakes as a result that there was this feeling of I can just go in and I can save these animals and I just need to have a military approach um, but now uh, his organization doesn't accept trainees that describe their motivations in this way because they still need to address the deep emotional effects of their experiences in warfare and they're not appropriate for uh, for, for working in conservation in really sensitive environments where you've got to work closely with local communities. Um, several of the private military company um, interview, uh, private military company representatives that I interviewed for the book um, said that their recruits could be attracted to conservation as well because the work could have positive impacts on mental health. Um, so VetCorps particularly explicitly states that its work can help veterans come to terms with a post-traumatic stress disorder following their combat experience. So the director of another private military organization, um, a US veteran who'd served in Iraq, uh, was proud of the conservation work that they'd done um, and the beneficial mental health effects um, uh, that it had had on their staff. And he, he remarked that it's really beautiful, he said. They're saving animals, but the animals are also saving them. So these kind of healing and regenerative effects of being in an African context were also cited as having a positive impact on mental health for those who made this shift to conservation. Um, and so, so I think these, you know, it's very clear um, that private military companies, you know, have all sorts of different reasons for why they might get involved in um, in um, uh, in conservation work. 
But there are real problems and real risks with this, I think. Um, and as I move to the next slide, I'm, what, I, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that any of the private military companies that I talked to or that appeared on the slides are responsible for some of the actions that I'm about to talk about. Um, it's, a, a, it's a much wider um, set of issues and dynamics. So there are real ethical problems with the development of what we might think of as more militarized responses to poaching and wildlife trafficking. And um, uh, those lie in uh, human rights abuses and also militarization of conservation. So the expansion of private military companies operating in conservation, particularly in Africa, has generated concerns about variability in practices, in professionalism and in oversight. So despite the proliferation of these organisations, there is no common code of practice today or set of guidelines against which they can be benchmarked. Much could be learned from the humanitarian sector, um, especially since they often already work with military actors in areas of armed conflict, and they operate under intense pressure and often face threats from armed groups. So there are precedents that could be drawn on to deal with this. So for example, the International Committee of the Red Cross has drawn up guidelines for those engaged in security and protection work for humanitarian and human rights actors working in areas of armed conflict. And these kinds of guidelines could be developed for conservation as well. Um, the variability in the quality of some groups operating in conservation mean that some, some private military companies have sought to distance themselves from other companies or individuals in order to protect their reputations. So one representative of a conservation organization which trains and deploys veterans expressed their real concerns that there were now so many of these kinds of military training NGOs being established by US war veterans with very little regulation or oversight that either the US government or from US government or from the governments of the countries that they operate in. And the variability of the quality and the types of practices that they engaged in were giving all of the private military companies offering these services what they said was a bad name. So um, they stressed that recruits needed to be carefully vetted and undergo a rigorous training program. And that only a small proportion of, um, of applicants would ever make it to on the ground work. And um, NGOs that are very much focused on indigenous rights and human rights have raised really important criticisms of the militarization of conservation. So some of you may already be familiar with a campaign by Survival International called Stop the Con, which is about the abuses by conservation authorities in India, Cameroon and the Central African Republic. Rainforest Foundation UK also have produced several reports on the abuses of forest peoples in the Congo Basin at the hands of government conservation agencies and conservation NGOs, some of whom have been trained by external military training companies. Um, and the image that you can see here um, was, uh, has now become quite well known, I think, um, and it was produced as part of an article for BuzzFeed News in 2019 because they carried out a year long investigation into human rights abuses by rangers employed and trained um, by WWF in Chitwan National Park in Nepal, in Kaziranga National Park in India and across several different examples in Africa. Um, and as a result of that article, WWF had to launch a thorough internal review and um, uh, investigation. Um, there are things that we could say about whether the report was actually that useful or that thorough. Um, in the end, uh, WWF concluded that it was not responsible uh, for the actions of particular park guards um, who had been trained by military personnel. Um, but it's really important to be aware um, of the abuses that might go on at the hands of conservation authorities. There can often be an assumption that conservation is an inherently good thing, that it's a legitimate thing, um, and that there can be no criticisms raised against it. But actually, um, I think it's really important um, to draw attention to uh, abuses and to any injustices on the ground, because in failing to do that actually makes conservation really ineffective 
and makes it fundamentally unjust. So I'll wrap things up um, now with this kind of last slide. Um, uh, and, um, and I'd be very happy to answer questions, um, uh, uh, to, to answer qu any questions that anyone had. But I think these sort of rising rates of, the, of poaching of some of the world's most iconic species since around 2008, 2009, really catapulted the issue of the illegal wildlife trade to the forefront of global debates about biodiversity conservation and the effects of environmental change. There were these kinds of genuine concerns that poaching and trafficking were going to drive some iconic species to extinction. And then that combined very powerfully with the fears of governments, donors and international organisations about the potential threats to global stability if illegal wildlife trade was indeed uh, funding organised crime and armed groups. Um, and in the arena of tackling the illegal wildlife trade, these threats are very clearly presented as armed groups and organised crime networks. So I think placing this in the case, in, in the context of uh, international donor, uh, donor funding also reveals that what can be debated and decided at an international level and led by mainstream conservation organisations can actually produce very problematic approaches to tackling illegal wildlife trade. Um, there are in clear imbalances of power, actually, that then go on to shape the everyday experiences of people engaged both in the enforcement of conservation um, and those who live with the kind of negative effects of enforcement and of trafficking networks. Um, uh, at its most extreme, actually, um, I think that the sort of folding together of security and conservation can result in militarization and the use of deadly violence against uh, local communities um, who live with wildlife. And none of this, I think, tackles the structural driver, the real drivers, the underlying drivers of the illegal wildlife trade or of biodiversity losses. Um, and I'll leave it there. I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions um, that anyone might have. Uh, thank you, uh, Rosaline. I'll, I'll use the chair's prerogative to uh, start with my own first question and, and, and uh, make a couple of comments. So, thank you for such an interesting and powerful, excuse me, presentation. Um, uh, with a, uh, you know, I, I, I guess you uh, look at the world through a particular lens, uh, which is uh, a, a very interesting one. Um, you know, look around your home, as you said, and uh, there'll be wildlife products there. Some of them illegal. Um, uh, and that, you know, and you think of uh, the um, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the armed groups in Congo, in Laos and so on, that have connections to the illegal wildlife uh, trade. Um, I guess uh, the, there are several questions uh, in, uh, that, are, that I'll come to on the sort of theme of um, dampening demand and creating incentives for communities to protect wildlife, which are the other two sort of points in the triangle uh, opposite disrupting supply and uh, you know I wonder whether we've we've dealt with uh, disrupting supply by sort of pointing guns at it because that's in a way a sort of you know simple thing to do there's a poacher let's shoot them um, uh, and it's a, a sort of an easily uh, described thing uh, you know when you said we need to uh, address some of the structural drivers um, you know, uh, clearly in inequality and so on and uh, poverty breed, um, you know, the need need for income and, and, and so on. Um, but in practice, what are these structural drivers that you would change? You know, what are the things that you would, what, what are the policies that you would advocate there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks. Um, so, yes, I do think that um, tackling the sort of underlying drivers in the illegal wildlife trade would be much more effective. So there are things like, you know, addressing, you know, what might be alternatives for communities that provide wildlife products at source. So communities that might be engaged in, um, uh, who might be engaged in poaching of rhinos or, uh, or poaching of ivory, you know, what, what, what might be the alternatives that they might be offered? And by that, I mean genuine alternatives in consultation with those communities, not just a kind of glib, well, if we turn it all into an ecotourism attraction, then people will make money from running hotels or being tour guides. Um, we know from substantial bodies of work 
um, that wildlife based tourism often does not produce the kinds of benefits to local communities that are claimed. So the jobs are often the sort of lower grade menial jobs. Um, they might be trackers and guides or hotel employees, but they're very rarely the owners of wildlife businesses. So when I say sustainable alternatives, ones that are kind of genuinely locally appropriate and have been in consultation with those communities, you know, so thinking beyond just tourism, you know, do people in those communities want to be doctors, lawyers, vets, and where might be the training for that? So providing those kinds of real alternatives, I think is really important. Um, and I also think that demand reduction is really important as well. And demand reduction isn't just something that can be projected out into, you know, we need to stop demand in Asia. There's demand for wildlife products. There's demand for ivory. There's demand for rhino horn. There's demand for all sorts of wildlife products within Europe as well that could also be addressed. But we need to do that in culturally appropriate ways. So um, I had a, a working with me and the team of researchers um, working on the BIOSEC project had a terrific colleague, Anne Vu, who's just written a paper all about how external campaigns to stop the use of rhino horn in Vietnam just didn't make any sense locally because they all revolved around don't use rhino horn in medicines. It's just like biting your fingernails, which made no sense locally, whereas campaigns that might have been around, you know, it doesn't make you look rich. It doesn't make you look powerful might have been more appropriate. A bit more cultural so sensitivity, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen, by the way, oh, so sorry, then yes. we, can, we can see more of you. Um, I, there are a couple of interesting um, uh, uh, comments and questions here from uh, sure. a, a, someone called uh, Ray Heaton. Um, uh, one of them, uh, if one thinks of global inequality, wildlife and ecosystems harm as the push of wildlife crime, then international markets, he says, are the pool, e.g. the big varied markets like China, Europe and the USA. Um, and he says, do you feel that reducing demand for illegal wildlife products is, an import, is as important as encouraging livelihood improvements and sustainable ecosystems with intact biodiversity? So it's that balance, you know, where, where would you put the efforts? Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree 100 percent. You know, I think it's really important to address demand for wildlife products and we know it can be done. Um, because back in 1988-89, which is actually one of the first times that I was really getting into conservation and thinking about the illegal wildlife trade, there were loads of really big high profile campaigns about ivory. This was a time when um, elephants were under massive amounts of pressure from ivory poaching um, and demand just disappeared in Europe and North America almost overnight. So we know it can be done. Also demand for ivory in Japan also dropped significantly. And ivory as an issue or ivory trafficking as an issue dropped off the international agenda for a decade or more after that. So we know that demand reduction works. Um, it's very rare actually that demand reduction works as quickly as it did in the case of ivory back in 1989 when the ivory ban was instituted by CITES, which is the Convention for the International Trade in Endangered Species. Um, when the ivory ban was instituted in 1989, demand for ivory in Europe and North America had all already dropped off a cliff because people simply didn't want it. It had no value for them. Similarly in Japan as well. So we know it can work. It's often very long term. And one of the arguments I often get about enforcement is, is that, well, we need to do something now to save these animals, but we're now 12 to 15 years in to using security based approaches and we're not that much further forward. And I think if we right. spent the last 15 years working on demand reduction, we might be in a better place. Thanks. Uh, we'll try and squeeze in two or three more questions. Sure. So uh, perhaps just brief, brief answers to these. Yeah. Um, uh, interesting uh, uh, question from someone called Vic. Uh, do you have a view on solutions for UK communities which are involved, um, or I, I guess uh, she or he means uh, uh, suffering from the killing of birds of prey for grouse and pheasant shoots? So this is to you know try and stop these birds of prey killing the the um, uh, I was going to say the goose that laid the golden egg, but you know what I mean. Um, should we be raising the inequality message uh, more? In other words, you know, what what are the uh, things that you can draw from your experience internationally to uh, to to sort of uh, think about this uh, 
um, you know, the people who are illegally killing birds of prey. Yeah, so again, it, it, very briefly, that's a good example of wealth and inequality, um, because very often those who are responsible for killing raptors in the UK are those who uh, work with wealthy estates. Um, so I think looking at the dynamics of wealth and inequality and actually tackling the, the actors who are actually involved rather than um, rather than looking at kind of the easy options, um, is is really important. So I, I would agree. It's, that's actually more of part. So of, just just to um, unpick your um, yeah. euphemism filled sentence there. I was being do, careful. Do, do, <laughs> do, do you mean that uh, we should be going after the landowners and not the yes. um, uh, not the people who are supposedly doing their bidding? Yes. Um, in which case, you know, what policies would you use to to try and uh, you know the the thing is illegal anyway. So what what policy would you instigate to try and get those landowners if you see them as the culprits yeah I mean, there, to could, do that. there could be much bigger penalties there could be uh, better prosecution rates i think it's the, the sort of raptor killing in the uk at the moment isn't my area of key specialism so i don't want to give okay i don't want yes. to talk yes. too much about it because i know it's a very complicated area but it is one that we're starting to look at in the current project um, uh, thank you. Uh, there's a, uh, a a comment here which I'll just read out, and I, I think you, you would probably just uh, nod to. But uh, interesting from um, uh, Sandra Charity Lister in South America: illegal wildlife trade is increasingly converging with other nature crimes, such as illegal logging and illegal fishing, and with other serious crimes like drug trafficking, people trafficking, arms trafficking. Currently, organized criminal groups are diversifying from drug trafficking to include nature crimes, which, as you say, have lighter penalties and less risk. Organized crime has grown exponentially in places like Brazil, and some conservationists feel like the priority in tackling organized crime as a means of tackling nature crime should be there. Um, I mean, I guess you would agree with that. Um, yes, I, it, it, largely I do. I mean, I think there are there are very good examples of where organized crime networks have moved into wildlife trafficking because it's you know, because of the low penalties and the low chances of getting caught. Um, I think they're not specialised wildlife trafficking networks. They often are involved in drugs, uh, weapons, human trafficking as well. Um, and then I think, you know, it, it is really important to tackle those networks, but also tackle how those networks work with legal companies and also with perhaps corrupt government agencies as well. Um, so it's not just that organised crime networks are somewhere outside normal society, it's that they're interlinked, both legal and illegal trades can often be linked in together. Right. Um, uh, Rebecca Nesbitt, um, uh, thanks you for the great talk, but uh, asks, we, we see all the stats for poaching of very charismatic species, you know, the rhinos, the elephants and so on. Um, but presumably this kind of poaching is vastly less common than actual subsistence hunting, um, which is often defined by conservationists as poaching, uh, she says. Um, do we know statistics about that? Do you have um, any thoughts on why it maybe doesn't get the same attention? I mean, I assume because the animals aren't so charismatic. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of different things going on. I mean, I think the impact on the wildlife populations in from subsistence poachers is, tends to be less. It doesn't mean it's not significant. It just it does tend to be less. Um, and the animals themselves aren't as charismatic. So if I can use an example from, um, from the UK and from Europe, uh, there wasn't really that much interest in uh, illegal extraction of glass eels until very recently. And now eels are critically endangered. The list is crit critically endangered. And wildlife trade is one of the drivers of, of that endangerment. Um, but eels aren't particularly pretty to most people. I think they're wonderful. Um, but most people think, oh, disgusting, I'm, I don't really care. And I think that is that is part of the importance is, is that, you know, Western publics in particular, they love rhinos, they love elephants, they love tigers. You can get lots of attention. Conservation NGOs know you can get lots of attention, lots of funds, lots of public backing for campaigns around those animals, less so for something that's a small antelope or a glass eel. Or, or, or even a, a tree or a plant. Yes, you know, absolutely. Which are, which are, are my loves. Yes, um, I think that's right. Actually, the sort of there is some a sort of term is plant blindness, but there is a 
there's a tendency to think of illegal wildlife trade as only animals, but actually timber trade and plant trafficking, the, the largest number of, of, the, of the largest category listed under CITES is orchids. Um, so plants are, it, are really key in wildlife trade. And, and of course, those plants are the basis of the, uh, the ecosystems in Absolutely. which the animals live. Um, I, we're, we're out of time. Uh, we've we've done well in, uh, in dealing with the questions we have. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, to everyone who's uh, sent in questions. And uh, as, as someone has, uh, Julianne Hargreaves has just said, thank you so much for your dedication to these issues. So, um, oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah, and there are plenty of other comments like that as well. Uh, lots of people saying wonderful talk and so on. So look, uh, I can only add my thanks on behalf of the Linnaean Society uh, to you for both the work that you do and also for, um, uh, for taking the time to talk to us this evening. So thank you very much. Uh, the talk at some point will be up online, I believe. And uh, remember, do please, uh, if you're interested in um, the Linnaean Society, have a look online and uh, consider joining us. We're always uh, interested in more members from all parts of the world and all communities. Thank you very much.